Okay, everyone. Uh, welcome. We're just a few minutes late, but uh, I'm glad everyone could take some time out on their Saturday to uh, come and uh, ask questions, listen to Lorette and her answers to your questions, as well as, um, you know, allow uh, Lorette in this case, since she's the only one here, to be able to uh, to speak a little bit about uh, you know, her position on some of the things that are going on uh, right now with regards to this recall. This is the third of our events that we have scheduled. We have at least one more. Uh, we've talked about having four all along. We may have more than that. Uh, we'll just have to see how things go. Um, but again, thanks for coming out. Uh, I am going to turn it over to Lorette and let her make an opening statement. And then the floor is open for questions. If you would prefer not to stand up and ask a question personally, you can write them down. And uh, our moderator, Doug, will be more than happy to uh, answer those questions for you. Otherwise, um, I do have a microphone, so you guys uh, are more than welcome to ask your questions directly. This has always been an open forum, and it's about transparency. Um, we have not made this a closed event to only focus on one person. We believe, as uh, Inglewood Citizens for City Transparency, and also now Inglewood TV, so stay tuned for that. But we honestly believe that uh, the city is run by its people. We elect our officials. And as such, we need to have as much transparency about what's going on um, as possible. We don't want to have things done in a closed session that shouldn't be done. We don't want to have a group of people pulling strings somewhere that uh, we don't know about. Really, it's about making sure that our city continues to be run and for the people and by the people. So to that end, I will turn it over to Lorette. She'll make a, an opening. Uh, statement and then we'll get going. Thank you. Hi everybody, thank you for coming. I greatly appreciate you taking time out. I think it was very nice that um, at least one of these debates be on a weekend when people can attend. A lot of people work. I know I work, I work a lot, so uh, sometimes the weekend's a little bit uh, easier for everybody. Um, whether this organization had a debate or um, I did them myself or the committee that's working with me would do it. Um, it is my intention to at least make myself available uh, for some type of debate. Anybody from the other side, anybody who um, is a proponent of this recall would be welcome, always welcome to come and ask the questions. I think I would like to keep this to the issues. Um, so far, I think I've done a pretty good job of keeping it to the issues that have been brought up and not personally personal attacks. And so far, I believe that um, the accusers <laughs> have made this very personal and um, and not about the issues, and that's that's very sad, and it's disruptive to the community. Um, I don't think that that helps us move forward in the future when we're not addressing the things that we could do better, uh, analyzing the things we do well, and then uh, trying to see where we can go in the future. Whether um, somebody likes the way that I breathe or not is uh, is not going to help us decide those future issues. I am informed because I ask questions. I'm informed because I talk to all of you and I don't um, generally come up with the issues myself. I come up with issues and problems or concerns going on in the community because I listen to you and you bring them to me and then we have a conversation and then we try to analyze whether we can do that better, whether it's right and whether we're moving in a good direction. But we can't get better if we don't listen to each other. So I'm very disappointed that the uh, people who have done this recall have refused to come um, have the conversation to um, debate and uh, the personal attacks have gotten a little out of hand. but. Um, I think I can stick to the issues pretty well because that's, that's what I know. So thank you very much for all of you coming out and um, be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Oh, thank you.
Um, first question is, is Englewood building an army against its citizens? Um, and I think it goes with the second question, why would Englewood Police Department purchase a $500,000 armored vehicle? Uh, why would Englewood Police Department be using incendiary rounds when training? Um, Recently um, found out that the fire that happened, uh, I believe last September, uh, in Highlands Ranch area that uh, caused the evacuation of 36,000 homes out there was a result of our police department training out in that area um, and that they may have used rounds that they were not authorized to use out there. I don't know whether that's the case or not. I know that it's being investigated. So if the police department um, was the catalyst for that fire out there. Um, if their training caused that fire um, and the evacuation of those homes, then I'm sure that all of that information will come out. Um, the armored vehicle, um, I, can sh I share the citizens' concern that um, that may be an excessive for a community of 33,000 people to have something that looks like it's much more um, geared toward uh, kind of St. Louis, kind of Chicago style riots. So I think the discussion has to happen on how we're using that, um, what the um, intergovernment agreements might be with other entities for using that, but there's a concern. There's a concern on a lot of levels on how we're spending the $32 million uh, that we will have to repay uh, that went to the police department. The original bond issue was for $27 million. They did a, um, what's, uh, the way that they sold the bonds, they garnered another $5 million on that, so we will end up paying back $32 million. Um, it's a 55,000 square foot building. Uh, it's rather large and for only 110 employees. And I have already heard concerns from the community that they believe that we're building that because they think we were going to go towards some kind of annexation for Denver. I hope not. We are an independent community, and I hope we remain that way. But we do have the $32 million to pay back. I will. We will be following up on the equipment that they buy um, and why they or feel the need to have that as well as the uh, fire and the evacuation and the role that we played in that as we get some more information. All right, next question is, why were you okay with having an election for District 1 but are objecting to the money being spent for a recall? And then did the election go against the charter? I'm assuming they mean the election for District 1. Uh, the election for District 1, the charter <coughs> allows for, if the council is going to be appointing anybody to replace an open seat, to fill an open seat, that means that there's probably an even number of council members. And the reason we have seven is so that we don't have ties. Um, when you have a person that's missing and you're going to be replacing that for whatever reason, in this case it was because uh, Mayor Joe Jefferson in last November was elected as our municipal judge, leaving half of his term available in District 1. The charter um, process uh, has gives, uh, gives us 30 days to go ahead and counsel to appoint somebody. We had nine people originally that came to be appointed, then it was quickly pared down to seven, and then counsel interviewed them. Uh, there was also an open house, and counsel with only six members was somewhat, was split. Um, neither side uh, uh, agreed that the other three, uh, each of us respectively had two candidates that we came up with um, and neither side was willing to say we'll compromise on that. And that's okay. Um, 
we are not the district one representatives and that the uh, that there is a split it just means that there's different ideas and different representation going on um, the charter then prescribes that if within that 30 days council cannot come to a decision which they were brilliant to understand that when you have an even number you could end up with a tie and that's what happened so the charter allows for then if it within that 30 days council cannot come to a decision then it goes to an election and as uh, I discussed with council member Sierra who was uh, eventually elected in that special election uh, the best thing that could have happened for District 1 was that he was elected and I have enjoyed working with him. He was elected by District 1. He owes nobody on that council his position, his seat. He is not beholden or obligated to any other council member. He is obligated and beholden to the citizens of District 1 who elected him. And I think that's exactly the way it ought to be. And I believe that he's done a pretty good job so far. And I think that he's done a good job and is getting support from the community because he went out there, campaigned, garnered their support, and was elected. So yes, I do think it's legal. Uh, it's part of the charter prescript, the par part of the charter process that if the council cannot come to a decision, then it goes to an election. The reason that the then it goes to an election is in the charter is because it, they understood that it could come to a tie, and that's exactly what happened. As for the recall piece of it, I am not against the money being spent per se. I'm against the recall. <laughs> so I, it's unfortunate that uh, such a small number of people can go ahead for uh, reasons that are not that I've done anything illegal just that they just that they don't like the stands that I have taken uh, the argument that somehow I didn't really win the election um, is we've gone all down a rabbit trail of other accusations because the original accusations they made are not sticking with people so they've gone down a few other um, areas what they're trying to do is just redo an election that they didn't like the outcome for great thanks a lot uh, we do have a question over here uh, but before we uh, have this question asked stepping back with regards to the annexation by Denver is that just purely rumor at this point or has there actually been any kind of discussion that you're aware of Occasionally, council gets a little surprised by what's being discussed by the administration, but so far, I haven't heard that on the part of the administration. I have heard some comments on next door and some concerns from people, mostly generated out of losing our fire department to Denver, uh, believing that that's kind of a camel's nose under the tent type of deal that we're just kind of slipping into that. Uh, I have not heard anything that would make it official on, on on there there is a push especially in the south metro area for regionalization and the regionalization of our uh, wastewater treatment plant uh, which is no longer called the littleton inglewood wastewater treatment plant um, but this push for regionalization uh, might be um, taking away from local government control and that's a concern whether it goes to denver or not and um, there's some concerns and and some of them might be justified we'll see great we have another question you brought up the uh <clears throat> situation with the police department and the uh, brush fire almost forest fire that was started uh, in a community to the south of us uh, from what i have been told that that community actually filed a lawsuit against the police department uh, a very large lawsuit and that was finally settled for a lesser amount i believe six thousand dollars or nine i'm not sure exactly which my question would be who's going to pay that who authorized the use of incendiary rounds which were absolutely illegal during a fire ban and who 
with the police officers who were down there? Can we get those names? And can we find out who's going to pay this $6,000? Will it be the city? Will that come from our, our, our pockets because they wanted to go have a holiday to shoot some incendiary rounds? Uh, or I'm going to go ahead and uh, exact uh, what, what Mayor Olson would do to me and go, is there a question in there? <laughs> <laughs> so far, the council has not been apprised of the either the lawsuit or any settlement on any lawsuits. So I believe with the uh, investigative piece that have gone has gone on with this and council has not been apprised of it yet that they will be by Monday because the issue has now come up and the questions obviously will come up on who's going to pay that how um, our insurance uh, I assume that we will be advised from the city attorney that's their job thank you for the question I have one more it's very short. With the uh, recent disaster of major proportions that we had in Inglewood, how come in the uh, capital budget meeting last Monday night of City Council, there are no funds available for rectifying that problem, as there has been no funds available for rectifying that problem since Inglewood was founded? In all fairness, when we were originally founded, there was no problem because we actually had, it was all new and we didn't have all those homes. In that particular area for a coma, uh, I don't believe that those homes were built until the 60s or late, either in the 50s or 60s. It was identified as a flood plain area at that time and for some reason now uh, the people who have uh, own homes in that area are being told that they were not ever told it was a floodplain area. Although uh, Doug Cohen brought to council maps that showed that it, that it was designated that way. So as we're working on this issue to find out exactly the connections of all of the pipes that have been rerouted and um, as they took away the tributaries and started um, uh, along the uh, ditch started putting in piping and then covering it up as we've had more development go and cover up more uh, uh, asphalt more areas so that you have the water run, running running and running faster so it's not being absorbed like it would be to gravel or grass into ground but once we have the additional development I think some amazing suggestions were made by a citizen who owns property over in that area who was affected by the flood um, and council finally did get that information and a couple of those are that we need to address the development before we move forward with any more development the impact that it might be having on some of these areas and trying to better identify what obviously was a floodplain area and has had some problems it's very isolated but it's very devastating for that area and it is designated now as a flood uh, we're being told it is a floodplain area so we're trying to figure all of that out i think that we'll get some more information on that um i think that it's reasonable for them to i don't think studying it for a year is probably reasonable but i do think that the studies that they did both in 1980 and 1999 do need to be readdressed or at least looked at uh, within a short period of time for us to make an assessment of what we need to do moving forward. I disagree with the city manager. I, I do believe council and citizens affected in that area need to be part of a debrief in order to understand exactly how it impacted it and where we can do better. Um, Until it's resolved, what about the people in the area and their insurance? Microphone. You want to repeat the question? <clears throat> I'm asking until that's resolved, what happens to the people in that area and their insurance policies? And um, what they're required to get and what they can get. Right. And that's exactly what we're working with that um, some of the. Uh, the constituents have brought up is if it's designated in a floodplain that they should then they would be able to get insurance but I'm also being told that 
there is nothing that stops anybody from getting flood insurance currently. So until we can kind of resolve some of those issues, the city has offered a very minimal um, assistance program for $1,000. I did ask that anybody who applied for that assistance have a uh, appeal process. Uh, because I have already heard that people have applied for that while that's very minimal and I believe you have to have $2,500 of uninsured damage in, in order to qualify for that and the community development director did show us a form. I asked for council to be given a copy of the application and for there to be an appeal process so that if anybody applies and is turned down that they have somebody else that they feel they can talk to. Part of the concern was that was brought to council was uh, the behavior or comments of some of our employees um, in the permitting process and how they were gonna be making money off of this whole thing. And that was inappropriate at the time. Um, I don't know whether they were joking or what was going on. Council at the last council meeting uh, agreed to go ahead and waive any permitting fees for people affected um, as they were trying to rebuild. They also made a legitimate concern that a lot of times when you have an incident like this happen, you can't just all of a sudden the next day start rebuilding. So for it to be extended for a, certain, for a period of time that's reasonable to allow people to gather funds, get insurance settled, figure out how they're going to um, address whatever, however they were impacted, get contractors and get workers out there, it may be something that takes more than two months. So we're, we are trying to work through that. But we need to hear from the citizens on what it is they need instead of telling them what we're going to do immediately without understanding what it is they need. And that's what we're in the process for. But I'd like for that process to be as short as possible. Thank you. That was a good question. In a previous answer, you mentioned the fire department and the agreement that we now have with Denver um, in taking over our fire department. My understanding is there was approximately a $4 million savings to Inglewood as a result of that. Can you elaborate on that, uh, whether that's accurate? And if there was, uh, where that money is going to now? Um, the fire department was um, given over to Denver prior to my getting on to council. Um, in that for first year, um, looking for that savings, which has been noted anywhere from two to four million, three million, somewhere in there, um, it was at the time touted that we were going to be saving, we needed to save that money because we were headed for a fiscal cliff and it needed to be done in order to just maintain status quo just to go ahead and survive. The original moving the fire department over and that personnel, both the obligations that we had to those employees and then moving them over to Denver and their ability to test and get hired and whether they would pass the test in order to main, to go over to Denver or whether they would be going to other entities or whether they would be retiring. That whole process cost us $2 million for those employees. So we were not exactly, we were still in the red on this whole deal at, from the beginning of it. Once you, um, the major savings that came out of the fire department was paring down personnel and the assessing, kind of a, a, agreeing that we might have been a little top heavy in our fire department. Um, that, um, and Denver did that. That's what Denver did. There were two things we needed to do. We probably had a little bit top heavy in our personnel and we needed to close the Tihone station. Um, the argument at the time was that we couldn't have firemen going out of the stations in the disrepair that they were in. We didn't go with South Metro. They would have taken our land and our buildings and owned them. We still currently own those fire stations, and we still currently do the capital improvements to those buildings. Denver does not. So we gave up our equipment. They still run the fires out of the same buildings that our guys did. We closed the Tihon station, got closed, and they 
kind of right-sized the uh, fire department personnel. And those are things that we probably could have done ourselves. I know that there's some political hit for doing things like that, closing a fire station and right-sizing a department, um, and somebody else did it. Um, but we don't have fewer fires now. Uh, we don't have fewer emergency calls than we did before. It, um, so I think there might have been some better ways to work this out and still keep the kind of control that uh, we would have had. We have a 20-year agreement with Denver. It continually goes up. Um, uh, there is always the opportunity that we may be able to do something else in the future because you cannot have contracts that obligate future councils that is a violation of TABOR. So this contract comes up every year and then we can make decisions on how we're going to handle it in the future. Unlike going with South Metro, we did not give up our land, we didn't give up the buildings, they don't own that, we did give up, I believe, a lot of uh, we gave up the equipment, but we always had previously for equipment we didn't have, we always had intergovernmental agreements with other entities surrounding us so that if we didn't have a particular piece of equipment, somebody else did. Um, and we've always shared back and forth between Sheridan, Littleton, Denver, Greenwood Village. We, we all have always helped each other out when we had that situation. Can I would. I would like to try and push for an answer here. Uh-oh, there was a, um, I tried. <laughs> um, the, the $4 million figure, which I've heard before for the cost savings, is actually rather interesting to me. And the question is, <clears throat> has anybody presented any specific documentation or light items where you could see that? Because Littleton's cost for running its fire department is between 7 to $8 million a year. So a $4 million savings would be a 50% or greater savings, which is a phenomenal savings to achieve. So has there been any specific data that shows what the actual savings is or that substantiates a $4 million savings? Because that's a that would be a phenomenal savings. You know, that number keeps changing. It was originally a $2 million savings. Then I've heard three. Um, and if it was ever a $4 million savings from that original piece, which was the switch over from Denver, Inglewood to Denver was in the middle of the year. So what happened was they started doing a different type of budgeting. So they m morphed some departments together. The new contract went under the city manager's office, and so it is somewhat difficult to get that apples-to-apples -apples comparison exactly to what's going on. Now the current contract is under the city manager's office, and you can see a contract and go, this is what we're going to end up paying at the end of the year. But the piece of it on exactly how much we saved with the other changes that happened, I, it, it is a little difficult. Now, if you um, put in uh, really good windows and your heat bill goes down one, one year, then you have a good basis to say, from the year I didn't have the windows to this year, I saved $100. The next year you go, I still have the windows. And I saved, but now how are you going to tell from, from year two, three, four to the other year? Well, you're not really still, it's, it kind of is a little bit of an accounting dilemma to sit there and go, you're still saving that piece. Um, yeah, so it, it kind of doesn't work that way. You save the original amount of money if there is anything to save. And the problem with that is that we had to spend so much money to help our employees be able to qualify somewhere else. And we did have to spend money to help them qualify. We gave them a, lo a lot of benefits and a, I mean, we were doing something to employees that we had made commitments to. I don't object to that happening. I object to the reason that it was happening. So it was my understanding was a little over $2 million that it cost us to move those employees over. So I haven't really gotten a real number from that, that first half year. And then I just keep hearing we're saving $4 million as if the general, budget, the, the general fund budget would be by default $4 million more than it is now. That's not true. That's just not true. Tion Station was closed. We have still spent money to do capital improvements to the um, 
buildings that Denver Fire runs its trucks out of. We still are doing that maintenance. We could have still done that maintenance since it was part of the issue. We would have done it before, so we're not saving there. Um, so it's been a little bit of a uh, rabbit trail to try to uh, try to find that out. But the numbers sound good when you just say we saved four million. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Question. Yeah, I've just got you know as far as. Uh, the truth behind the recall. Okay, I get this on my front desk, and it's pretty, the accusations are, well, there a lot of them are pretty big. So instead of spending 15 days going to these, can you tell me if they're, in a nutshell, specifically what prompted this, and who's, in your estimation, who's behind it? Well, first of all, I love the picture that they look because apparently, yeah, if you yeah, go no. through, if you go through a recall, I get 15 years younger. So, <laughs> um, and I do like that picture. Um, I, I believe that there's two reasons. One was when we, when I got on council in 2015, I was very specific about the reasons that I wanted to get on council. I thought that there were some. Uh, very serious issues, transparency, the city following the law, and um, some investigative things that needed to be looked at so that we were doing a proper process uh, and kind of handling our business above ground. Um, a lot of that happened shortly after I went into council, and it upset some it upset some people. And there was a constant, for the last two years, a constant kind of undermining a, a division of council, this constant kind of bickering and arguing. And then um, council changed last November, and the citizens decided they'd have had enough of that. And so uh, two people were replaced, and I believe they were replaced with people that are thoughtful who are trying, but they are also new, and so there's a lot of that history piece. So you didn't have that divisiveness on council anymore, but I'm still on council. But the divisiveness went away. So um, it might not be me. So um, without that kind of catalyst to have this constant under, this constant turmoil, this underpinning, um, it, it wasn't going in the direction that they wanted. So um, I continued to look for um, issues that I thought needed to be addressed. And one of them was the forensic audit, um, us following the law, and um, getting as much information as possible from our administration from the city so the council could make the best decisions in representing the constituents. I asked for a forensic audit and all of a sudden two ex-mayors came forward and said they would rather have me recalled. Um, this um, arguing that asking too many questions is somehow a deterrent to government moving forward um, is absurd. I mean, the more information that we can all have, then the better off we are in making sure that we're making the best decisions that we can. We can't guarantee that, but we can certainly do the work to make it happen. Um, I don't have a personal agenda. I am not trying to get some specific law passed because I have some, I don't have a personal agenda. I truly am trying to do the best job I can to represent District 3 and Englewood in moving forward. Um, I think that just having a consensus uh, for the sake of having a consensus has gotten us into a lot of trouble. Going along to get along gets you in trouble. If you are a concerned about having the debate, having the conversation, being informed, and you would rather just say yes, then we have made some pretty bad decisions with that kind of leadership. Um, a lot of things that have not ended up in Inglewood's best interest happened under Woodward and Penn's leadership. And I'm, and I'm sorry that they take this that I would like things to be better looked at, to be a better process for us to follow the law, for us to be transparent. I'm sorry that they see that as an attack on them. It is not. It is just my attempt to try to do a better job than I believe they did.
Oh, lots of questions. <laughs> <laughs> but I still like the picture. <laughs> I've read that it was a huge loss for Inglewood to lose the depot. Can we get it back? To lose the what? Depot. Train. Train depot? Okay. Depot Park. Depot Park. All right, apparently train depot park. <laughs> the uh, depot was actually in Sheridan as um, our historic preservation um, representatives have educated us several times and uh, history matters. There's been a lot of money spent on moving that old train station. One of the original intents was to try and make it part of the uh, light rail, uh, similar to what Littleton had done where they had taken one of their old train stations and um, made it part of their um, light rail over there on um, Main Street. So they moved it over at a considerable cost to a piece of property that the Inglewood Housing Authority actually owned through a whole other series of events and um, put the depot there. Uh, it was supposed to maybe be part of the train station at Bates Logan, and we lost that kind of opportunity. So it just kind of sat there at Dartmouth, and then uh, former council members wanted a community garden in that area and it kind of became this depot park. Uh, depot park, uh, the city then garnered this property when it put the depot on there. I think it was something like 283,000. I would have to defer to the historic society for the exact number. But once we put it there, uh, the city got control of that property put the depot there, and it became Depot Park. It was listed in the park's master plan from, I believe, 2003 or 2006. Uh, it was maintained by the Parks and Rec Department, and um, then when the Historic Preservation Society wanted it, all of a sudden the previous city manager decided that they just wanted to sell it. Um, I worked with the uh, save Inglewood Parks group. We got over a thousand signatures to Save Depot Park, but to designate all of the parks because the council at that time, Woodward and Penn, sitting on that council, along with some other people, one of which is still on our council now, voted two months before the ballot issue came forward to make sure that everything that was listed as a park was designated and required a vote of the people to sell the land. They sold it, said it doesn't matter if the charter says we have to vote on parkland, we say it's not a park. And the city attorney at that time said, if council says it's not a park, it's not a park. We Citizens don't have to vote on it. So they just sold it in August or September and the vote happened in November, and it was a resounding 80, 75%, I think, of the people that said that they should have a right to vote on the sale of parkland. Whether we can get the park, so I think the whole sale of it was illegal. It, w it was illegal, it was a park. It was designated as a park, it was in the park master plan, it was being taken care of by the Parks and Rec, and then some attorney just goes, it's not a park if you don't say it's a park. And under Woodward and Penn, they sold that park for $30,000 they sold that portion, the depot land, and the land it sits on, for $30,000. When there were offers on the table for more, and all of that is a moot point to me, because the citizens, it's the citizens, and they have a right by our charter to vote on the sale of any parkland, and that should have never happened. I hope that that could be undone at some point, uh, whatever the, it's come up several times what's going on with that property. I think it was illegal in the first place. I think that the citizens spoke very loudly uh, that they wanted the charter followed, and I think that they got waylaid two months before the election to go ahead and get rid of land that nobody had the right to get rid of. Okay, I think this is an easy one. Um, what happened with the Inglewood logo and changes to the sign? What was the cost? Um, Do you guys have a new logo? Yeah. 
<laughs> it seemed like when there when um, the economy changes around, everybody decided to to redo their rebrand. Uh, yeah, rebrand. Rebrand. Uh, much to the consultants. Um, the consultants, that's their happy time. They say, oh, everybody wants to rebrand and we get to talk. So uh, Denver did it, the state of Colorado did it, Littleton did it, and um, I, I, disagreed. I, I disagreed with that because I think that we might have been better served by embracing tradition and having some um, rebranding doesn't, isn't um, a symbol, rebranding um, can be a commitment, can be a feel, can be a we're recommitting to this community and uh, embracing the history of what that logo was before and saying what it means to us now and moving forward, both kind of a little meshing of the old and new. Uh, but that wouldn't have garnered anybody any money. So um, it's kind of like the old logo just grew leaves. <laughs> and so um, the purpose at the time that I was in attending those meetings prior to getting on in 2015 uh, as this whole process was starting started because we got a new city manager and the kind of attitude that this community was just old and stale and that these were the things that need to happen to not be old and stale um, a, I don't think that a logo necessarily provides that I think it's leadership. I like I said before. I think it's commitment. I think it's how we. Uh, I think it's how you build the culture up in an organization or in a community, and that we still haven't done that part. That we still haven't done the commitment part and the culture piece of it. And so, just kind of putting a new picture on something isn't going to go ahead and make things fresh. Um, it cost my understanding. Um, it was in several several phases so it's very difficult to get the entire cost part of it was the twenty six thousand dollars for the con consultations but they had already had three of them prior to that so there were some it was uh, uh, Inglewood forward um, there were community meetings so there was uh, there's a lot of money but it's kind of pocketed in different things the actual material for the street signs the cars we were told that all of that was going to be happening in stages so over, over a period of time so it ends up getting uh, a little difficult to know exactly the cost of of, of just the rebranding itself but it's more than one color. And so I know from doing flyers that if it's more than one color that uh, you end up with some, some issues. So um, I, I think people had, had some difficulty. Um, I, I, I think we would have been better to embrace some history, some heritage, and have, have some different dialogue about the, the old one. But most of that happened before I got on council. Do you believe, or is there proof that the city manager violated Tabor laws when spending $236,000 without council authorization? That's the question. It, he violated our process and procedures, and that's why he determined it was an emergency. Whether he violated the law regarding whether the money was appropriated or not is what we we're supposed to find out on Monday. It is in our packet. Um, Councilmember Quest and Councilmember Sierra both both requested it. I requested it several times, and it's my understanding that we will discuss it at the beginning of the study session this coming Monday. We've received the material. If the money was not appropriated for the 2018 budget, then it is illegal to spend unappropriated money no matter whether it is an emergency or not. Um, him deciding that something is an emergency and bypassing council and eight weeks later coming to get permission put council in a very awkward position and it is a violation of the, our process and procedures. So I guess we'll find out Monday. Uh, what is the, the city couldn't, have, what's, it, what's the plan, the city couldn't afford to pay to fix the roof at the old police station, 
Now where will the $200,000 a month come from, I'm assuming, to pay off the new police station? From all of the citizens who voted to go ahead and raise their property taxes to pay it off. The property tax will be raised to the level that will allow them to pay that off each year. That's the entire $32 million. That includes the additional $5 million that they garnered by doing a premium sale at a higher interest rate on those bonds. It comes from you. So people, the citizens of this community, rightfully, they have the right to go ahead and tax themselves. They tax themselves. That is an interesting figure because if that's true, that puts it into perspective exactly how much additional money the community has to come up with in order to go ahead and just pay off that building. Yes, I have a question. <clears throat> I'm from Ohio and I was a cop for 13 years. And I was also a firefighter for 13 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'd like to know in your budget why you don't have anything about physical fitness examinations because your fire and police department is fat and can't move. I'm telling you right now, if they ever have a heart attack, it's the council's fault, not theirs. Inglewood doesn't currently have any firefighters. Police officers. Oh, police, sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> the, um, That's a good, that is a good question on what the requirements are for our police and the physical fitness and the requirements in order to be on our um, police department. I had an opportunity yesterday in kind of looking over some numbers to, to um, be persuaded that we pay our police officers, at least according to the portal, the financial site, an average of $87,000 a year when the average in the state is saying that it starts them some somewhere in the state is around 46 and then maxing out it somewhere in the 90 depending on how people move forward um, and so it would appear from the portal on the positions that we are at the high end of paying people um, I would like to get a little bit more in, look at me, always wanting more information. Mm -hmm. So I would like to get some more information. I'm telling you the portal says that these positions are paid at $87,000 a year. That is money, that is not benefits. Uh, it says 87,000, so if it's straight salary money and that's what that's looking like, then uh, I think that we should be able to make a requirement so that we have a healthy force if we're already at the higher end. Well, the only thing I can tell you is, you've heard of state compensation? Mm -hmm. Have you heard of that? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sure your attorney has too. And there's rules she, and regula yeah. regulations <laughs> about state compensation. Uh -huh. So when you have a heart attack, who's going to pay for it? You are. We... We are looking as we're going through the budget as well on, on our pension plan and our insurance. So you're correct, we, that's, we do. We are already five officers down now because we still pay them. We still are obligated to make sure that those people are being compensated and I think that's appropriate. But then you're also, the community then is also doing without that position um, because they're still really in that slot and, and the money is being paid. So it's a point well taken. Thank you. Thank you. One more question over here. Okay. Kind of follow up to this gentleman's question of what would be like, um, what are the continued education requirements of the police force at this time, as there is with like educators and such, um, uh, especially like code enforcement or the impact team, um, just what are there required continued education? Um, expectations? Not that I'm aware of. Um, that would that would be a really good question to uh, for me to follow up on with them to ask how they're doing that. I would assume that within the police department, as we've been told before, that as the process of police officers moving up in the ranks, that obviously there's testing and requirements that are on um, that whether they have 
and I was on the Colorado State Board of Nursing, so I understand the continuing education, which was even stopped for that license as well, um, on how much that benefits. On, on, and the way it benefits is that you have to gear it to your community and what you believe is the culture and what's important in that community for them to keep it continued. Um, as it, the reason it was done away with in nursing was because you had people just going and taking kind of some fluff class that had nothing to do with the ER that they worked in. So if, if, if we don't have it, if we started something like that, it would have to be something that kept a culture that was important to this community to make sure that we had that information and that they were kept up to speed on those things. Indeed, and I, I suppose if we don't have that, I'd like to see how we can all uh, benefit and implement something along the lines, just for um, the police officers' benefit as well. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think that's a, a point well taken. I would make sure that that's... Um, as, a, as a general statement, we're... The three by four cards are for people to ask questions. Um, so, and, and I've got one or two cards here that really aren't asking questions, they're really attempting to make statements. And um, so perhaps you can reformat your uh, card into a question that can be directed to the candidate. Um, but a question here is last, with a statement, <laughs> last Monday night's meeting, 80% of the revenue goes to salaries which I think they're saying is about $40 million, leaving $10 million to run the city. Would you be opposed to reducing staff by 10% and using these funds to fix the flooding and damage? And I'll add, based on the sentiment of the audience, currently buying treadmills for the, <laughs> <laughs> for the police. Our new, our, our new police building is going to have a state-of-the-art fitness center in it, maybe. <laughs> Maybe that's being addressed already. Um, Sorry, I didn't mean to take you off. Well, the, there was some uh, sway that somehow we were going to give them equipment from um, the the other equipment that was used at Oxford. They are getting new equipment. My understanding is so. Um, the. <laughs> you took me off base with the police. That Sorry. wasn't very fair. <laughs> um, oh, the they afford it. They, the 80% yeah. of the revenue goes to salaries, which is roughly, apparently, $40 million, leaving $10 million to run the city. And, and by the way, the vast majority of most cities' budgets, as you know, go to salaries. Um, as so it would for any service, yeah. As it would for any service. Would you be opposed to reducing staff by 10% and using those funds to fix the flooding and the damage? Um, first of all, you have to have the numbers right. So if somebody just says, um, Lorette's not an accountant because she's not registered with the state. Well, then you, you need to ask another question, which is, do you need to be registered with the state? No, you don't. So you can create some of these kind of false dilemmas by just making statements as if you know what you're talking about. If you listen to the meeting on Monday, there was some confusion on the numbers. And I, since I am a real accountant, I'm going to go there and talk about the numbers. When it got brought up that 80% of the budget is personnel, and then the city manager just misspoke. He didn't mean to. He said nine million. We spent nine million dollars. And I go, well, 80% of nine can't be nine million. So they came up with the number and they showed us, no, it was in your packet. Here's the number from the packet before we showed you this. It's $29 million for personnel. And say, see, you were told that. But wait. Our budget is 50 million. That's not 80%. 29 is not 80%. So part of, part of what I think my job is, is to ask those questions. It's not just take for face value when somebody's go going and you sit there and go, okay, 29 million is not 80% of 50 million. Okay, so we need to come to some agreement on exactly where our percentages are coming from. 
are they talking about um, does that 29 million not include benefits? Um, do we really only do we really run the city on 10 million dollars? That would seem a little a little sparse to me. So I don't think that um, we have enough information to start um, pairing off money from from that. We need to get a little bit more information. As much dismay to the other side, I, I actually think that's important for us to know whether 80% of our budget is spent, what the 29 million represents, so that we can make some um, better decisions. I asked for the numbers of how many employees are currently working. Part of the current administration that we have is that they're bragging that they said they've cut personnel. But my concern is, is that we contracted out a lot of services. So what I asked for was if we contracted out services, then tell me how many people we're paying for in that contract, because that still counts. So you can't claim that you're cutting the amount of personnel you have if all you're doing is contracting it out. So when we when I have gotten those numbers, when I got those numbers last year, we actually had increased the number of employees that we either have or that we pay for through contract. We, we have increased the staff. I asked for those numbers again, they are in the packet. We went from um, supposedly the full time, just going on those numbers with not no questioning, then we we reduced the number of full time people. We we had pr approximately 400 and some other employees listed in 2014, and then now we've we've reduced the number of full time employees, greatly increased the number of part time employees and seasonal employees to where now the number says we have 800 employees. Well, that just wouldn't make, it doesn't make sense to me, either that we had that many before, or that we have that many really now. So I'm not really sure that we're comparing apples to apples. I only got the information on Thursday evening. But the reason I asked for it is because we keep saying we've decreased employees. So if, if it's necessary for us to right size the city and address whether the number of employees we have is, um, is the best fit for us, then that's a decision that we need to make. We, we, need to, we need to decide that, but I need to get legitimate information so that I know how we ran things 25 years ago when I first moved here, how many people were able to do that job then with the same population. We have the same, I, unless the census is crazy on how to count people, we have not changed our population. According to the census, we've actually gone down. So I don't know how they're doing it, but let's just say that we've got about the same population, then we should be able to handle it with about the same number of employees through time and, and figure out how we're handling things. But I don't know that I've got the correct answer yet to know whether there's, we have employees that we could do without or whether we're at the right spot now i don't i don't know I, you can go on the packet and look at that um, flow chart and I, I have a feeling that you'll ask some of the same question this that i will be asking on monday on how we went from 400 employees to 900 employees or whether they weren't counting certain places like the wastewater treatment plant before and they're counting them now i i don't know but i know that the city does not run as if we have twice as many employees so something is not right in what i'm looking at and so i need to ask some more questions until i know whether we can have a savings of money from getting rid of anything all right this question is why does the city council allow the city manager to run the city instead of the council Um, I think when I think the, that it's very easy for the leadership to have difficulty when there's all of this going back and forth on council and that's why I'm so grateful that right now we have a council that seems to be working well together that's willing to have conversation because until we take control of the authority that we have then we can't represent you. 
we, we can't if we give up our power if we give up our authority then we cannot properly represent the citizens of the community because we've acquiesced our power and authority to somebody else um, so I think it's always going to be somewhat difficult in a council manager situation um, because you have um, seven people and uh, uh, basically all all the, uh, the uh, you only need four people to go ahead and have some issue go and then you have what's close to a majority of council but not being able to exact policy maybe not feeling like they're being represented so um, I think it's very important that the council hold the city manager a, a person that they are responsible for directing and leading hiring and firing that is correct that's our job uh, that we make sure that we hold them accountable that they follow the law and that they are being directed by this council and not the other way around and that would be up to the citizens to make sure that they elect and support council members that are willing to stand up to do that job all right this question i think is a rehash of the question asked by i don't see him in here anymore but it's um a young woman died because Inglewood didn't fix the drains on South Acoma. And I think the rest of the question is, does Inglewood have anything in the budget to fix um, any part of that over the next four years? Um, currently, right now, what we were presented with was no, but the budget has not been decided. Um, we only have been provided information from the staff to council so far and council has not gone ahead and made its recommendations so whether they move money or not will it be up to the council the budget is up to the council okay <clears throat> any other questions but the budget wasn't balanced with the last year it wasn't balanced that's correct the general fund so budget. In your was opinion, right now, where are we on track for this year's budget? Especially with the deficit from last year, plus some of those issues. Mm -hmm. and we've also got got to have record revenue coming, right? Correct. We do have more revenue coming in, and like any other time when you have more money coming in than you hopefully are storing away your acorns for the times when it's not going to be as as uh, as lucrative, or using it for issues like capital improvements um, in 2016 um, sorry 2000 yeah 2016 um, like I said at the previous debate I agree with the recall committee uh, they put you to a link in the Inglewood Herald that says the budget's not balanced it was 91 million dollars worth of revenue and 97 or 98 million dollars worth of outgo that's not balanced we did end up doing a budget as a plan for the future. After the year was done, it turned out we did have more revenue than we had expected, and that was good, and that's good. My concern is not whether, like, your chicken little, Colin, because after the fact, you always know what happened, because it's after the fact. A budget is supposed to be into the best guess that you can do on what's the future, on what the future is. And I think when you're guessing, you should do the best job you can to balance it and not guess that you're gonna overspend. We shouldn't anticipate, we shouldn't plan to overspend and that's what those budgets were doing was they were overspending um, the reality of it later is the reality of it later well, I mean then opinion, it's easy well, in your opinion do you think that in prior years had, a, had an effect on us losing the, the, play, uh, the, the fire department yes and and all and the first two years that I was on council, all I heard was the impending fiscal cliff. Because to lose the fire department, that just didn't happen. One, two, that had to just call me. That had Correct. to come down the line, and I just. Correct. That we allowed the firefighters, that we allowed the police officers to function in a building that had a leaky roof, where they didn't have any storage for their uh, evidence, where where you saw the pictures where the boxes were all uh, stacked up on a desk and stuff leaking all over it. Uh, that didn't happen overnight. 
They didn't put the money into the capital improvements and they created a situation where we had to do something with the building. And the citizens decided, decided to spend $32 million for a new building. Had we done the proper capital improvements for that building, maybe that wouldn't have happened. Well, maybe we could have uh, saw a better way to handle the police building. Part of the reason that we got rid of the fire department was because we were told an exorbitant amount of money would be needed in order to bring those fire stations up, up to speed. They still run trucks out of the same buildings, and we are still doing the capital improvements on those buildings. So why didn't we just do that before? Close the station we needed to, right-size the department, and maintain our autonomy, our local control with our own fire department. But they didn't uh, do those capital improvements to those buildings. The, the, the deterioration of them, whether Denver is running a truck out of them or Englewood is running a truck out of them, was still laid at my shoulders when I got on there in 2015 because they didn't do it before. Maybe if they had not given so many tax breaks to apartment buildings, or King Supers, or I mean, maybe if we weren't giving money away to have the development and the additional density and the additional burden on our infrastructure, we gave away tax money to create that situation, the kind of further burden things. I don't, I don't know why they did it, I just know they did. Well, I think that does it for the questions. Um, Oh, there's, I'm sorry, there's another question. It's, it's not, a, it, it, it's really a statement concerning the depot. Uh -huh. And there is so much that happened with that depot that our citizens do not know. It, it was pure fraud. According to our district attorney's office, the biggest crime of the century is property. Mr. Parson said, he came to Fort Council and he said, I do not have to get a 401. I don't have to get any grants. I have $300,000 to put in this depot immediately to be renovated. And it's going to be a legacy for my children. They had a commission that was going to decide who was going to get the depot. Uh, that commission would not let us do, um, they only let us speak for a certain amount of time. We couldn't have the projector to show what we were gonna do with the depot. We couldn't bring anything to show. We brought Mr. When they brought Mr. Parsons in, he had all kinds of time. He got to do a, 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 a PowerPoint. He got to bring in what he was going to do. And to this commission, he told the commission that he had three or four hundred thousand dollars to put into this um, depot for immediate renovation. And so the committee selected Mr. Parson because he had the money to put into it. There's a whole history before that. I would really like to tell the citizens what happened even before they brought Mr. Parson in. It's, it's too long for me to tell here. But it, it might make you want to cry. We could not, and that's, and they were going to sell it the very first time. Um, that's where we formed the Inglewood Historic Preservation Society to keep them from selling it. We worked for two solid years. We had a beautiful plan for that depot. We even had a gentleman that wanted to come in and build a chocolate museum next to us. It would be the only one like it in the United States. They would be hiring people, 40 to 50 people. They would be making their own chocolate uh, because this was his business. And they would also, they would have rooms. They would have a room where children could come in and make their own chocolate. They were going to have a room of old world candies. He was going to teach. He was a chocolate, he was a master chocolatier and, and a pastry chef. He was going to have another room where he would give lessons. He was going to have a big veranda. I have a picture of his drawings. He was going to build, um, uh, he also did breakfast and lunch, and he had a big veranda. This building looked like a chalet that you see in England or all over Europe because he was from Germany. And he had offered to buy that uh, land 
prior to what they sold it for. And he was gonna donate the depot for us. The depot was never going to be the Inglewood Historic Preservation Society's building. It's gonna be the citizens' building. We were gonna be the custodians, we were gonna restore it. We had gotten grants, we had grants promised from railroads because it was a railroad depot. But they wanted you to own the building because they didn't trust city council people. They would give us money and they would, we still wouldn't maybe get the, the, the building. So we worked, we had an RFP, we had all this information, we showed them pictures. I talked to the, um, uh, the mayor at that time and had to make about three different appointments to come and give our presentation to a city council session. And they kept putting it off, and they kept putting it off, and I think the reason it was is because they were looking for Mr. Parson, or they were looking for someone else. So finally, we, made, we got the appointment, and before we could get up and present them our, our presentation, uh, we said, well, you can get up and, and present your presentation, but we're not gonna pay any attention to it because we think somebody else might wanna buy the, the depot, and we need to open it up to all citizens but they had already turned down two other offers. They had turned down two offers for 50,000. Mm -hmm. Our offer was for 65. And um, it's, uh, this is confusing. I, I, I mean, just speaking of, of, of a different amount of time, but it, it's to let the citizens know they didn't know anything about it. The only thing that came out of the paper was that uh, Inglewood was only offering a dollar, and Mr. Parson was offering 30000 mm -hmm. But they didn't give anything else information. They didn't give any of the detail. They didn't give anything. The reason, once the council told us that they weren't going to pay any attention to our, um, to our, this was before Mr. Parson came into the picture, our RFP. Uh, the gentleman that was going to build a chalet said, I'm out of the deal. These are very dishonest people and I don't work with dishonest people. I think it became very, very obvious that there were other offers that went on. And then of course, when they say Inglewood Parks got involved, that it was uh, that uh, over a thousand signatures in less than three and a half weeks, that it was very important to the citizens that they have control over that. I do want to just make a closing statement and then I'll let uh, people go ahead and get some more information on, on what's going on. I, <clears throat> I, the flyer that you got has been changed. Um, that you had said the flyer has been changed. The recall committee's information on their website has been changed uh, because I think it's become very clear that it was very spurious, very personal attacks, just um, they haven't shown up to one debate because I don't think that they can justify or defend their position for why I should be recalled. What was their reason for not showing up? Um, because, because um, they said that they were not going to fall prey to my manipulation of discussing the issues. So, um, so far, um, I, I don't know why two ex-mayors, uh, Jim Woodward spent 10 years on the city council. He was a mayor. If he doesn't believe that he has the speaking ability to go ahead and handle me, then I feel sorry for him. Mr. Penn, a football coach for 40 years, Who's, on, who's the president of the, of the chamber, who, who runs, who was mayor for four years, who sat on that council for eight years, if they do not feel qualified to debate these issues with me, then, I've, then I think what it shouts is that this is just personal attacks. This is for other agendas. This is for their own protection of whatever they think their legacy or their um, issues of how they handled their leadership or mishandled their leadership while they had the position. I'm not trying to never try to out the truth in order to expose any one individual just for us to expose that we could do it better. That they have taken it to this level is unfortunate because it unfortunately exposes the role that they played in the problems that we have experienced and that I had to deal with in coming into this council in 2015. This current council, there, um, as, um, as other issues have come up with uh, council members, um, 
I can guarantee you that I work well with the vast majority of this council, that they are there to go ahead and do the very best job that they can, that they are not trying to go ahead and make it divisive among council, they're truly trying to do their job. The few people, most of which are no longer on council, that are still trying to just disrupt it so that, um, to disrupt it a lot for just disruption's sake, um, I think is unfortunate when we have such a good group of people finally gathered together that can get some, get, get the work done. Um, so uh, I have no problem with working it with anybody on council. I uh, don't take the issues that we deal with personally and I think everybody's more than prepared to delve into the delve into the serious problems that we need to to address and also to spend some time celebrating some of the things we do really well and there are a lot of things we do well but you don't get better by sitting there sitting on your laurels you get better by dealing with the things that you can you can do better so um, I greatly appreciate everybody coming out um, Oh, there was one other issue. Of the two things that they brought uh, on the flyer, uh, the reason that they have increased the complaints against me is because their original complaints apparently weren't good enough to bring the pitchfork and torches out after me. People went, so you disagree with her. Why are you doing this? Why are you spending the money? Um, so then they added that I was against the police building and, I was against, and I'm against the schools. And... Um, I can tell you that I'm not only am I not against the schools, um, I have saved the school district by champion, uh, championing us not uh, taxing the school district on their new buildings. I have saved the school district a million six on their construction that we didn't steal from the children, we didn't divert it away from the uh, school district bond like Penn and Woodward did under their leadership, diverted money away from the bond issue for the high school. School, I've saved the school district a million, 1.6 million that they were able to keep for their projects, for those schools, for those neighborhoods, for those children, because the city didn't divert that money away by charging tax to a tax exempt school district. It was inappropriate when they did it before. You can listen to the tapes on how they argued with the uh, superintendent, then Brian Ewart, and almost came to fix the cuffs with the school board in the shouting matches meetings where Penn and Woodward told them they were gonna take their money and if they didn't like it, they could sue them, they'd probably win, but they would spend more money on lawyers than what they would end up giving to the school, uh, to the city. Uh, when I got on council and this new bond issue for the 110 million happened, I, I worked with the school superintendent to make sure that we came up with a way for them to uh, and make the argument and I championed the ordinance that stopped us from taking that money away from the school district. So for them to claim that somehow I am not a supporter of the school district is a little ludicrous and actually hypocritical. Thank you. Are you going to do a benediction again? Yeah, I guess I can do a benediction. I do want to, on behalf of the Inglewood Citizens for City Transparency and Inglewood TV, I want to thank everyone that came out uh, this afternoon, taking time out of your Saturday to uh, spend some time. And it's, it's interesting, every time we have the opportunity to speak with citizens and, and to have elected officials uh, represented, the questions that come out um, are give more evidence to the fact that we need more transparency in our environments. Uh, it was interesting, the first uh, debate that we had, I had a conversation with a gentleman and uh, he, was, he was asking about our organization and he couldn't understand why we needed to have more transparency in our government. He said, we have plenty of transparency. There's nothing that isn't transparent in our government. And I was actually taken back by that because 
just by the questions we have uh, this afternoon here in this short period of time, we obviously have more transparency that's needed. So I do thank everyone for coming out, for uh, Council Member Barentine, for all the citizens. And um, if you have not signed up, uh, please uh, sign up on the uh, uh, clipboard over there on the table. And uh, again, I thank everyone for coming out this afternoon. We will have another debate. Uh, it still is to be announced uh, when that will occur. Uh, but again, thank you for- I have some flyers on there. Um, the back table, I have a uh, my phone number, of course, uh, the uh, Gmail if you want to email me, my website if you want some additional information. There will be some additional events aside from what this group is doing. And certainly, I hope and have always made it available from the minute this started that any event that that anybody puts on I will I will attend if the recall committee or anybody representing them wants to put on an event I will be more than happy to go I will not question the location I will not question the time if they want to give me 24 hours notice I'll be there as long as it's not on a Monday night and I don't care who the moderator is I don't care who's asking the questions I just want to have the opportunity with anybody on the other side uh, and so if they want to put together an event I hope it's soon um, or if they want to attend any event here they will have a voice um, they will have a voice and if they do not think I'm right for Inglewood they should be defending their position so hopefully Hopefully they'll put in an event and we'll all have, uh, they'll feel more comfortable and safe to be at their own scheduled event and I will be in, in attendance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.